Hello and welcome. My name is Ewan McLean, and this is a presentation on prospective program analysis versus retrospective program analysis with particular reference to the NEC3 form of contract. In this presentation, I will firstly discuss the case of Walter Lilly and Mackay. Secondly, what to show on the revised programme submitted for acceptance under NEC3 when assessments of compensation events turn out later to be wrong. And thirdly, I will show a prospective programme analysis and a retrospective programme analysis running in parallel to see if they produce the same results for the same project under an NEC3 form of contract. I've also provided dynamic programme demonstrations to illustrate each of the issues raised. In the case of Walter Lilly versus Mackay, Mr Justice Aikenhead stated that the debate about the prospective or retrospective approach to delay analysis was also sterile because both delay experts accepted that if each approach was done correctly, they should produce the same result. This may have been true in that particular case and for a variety of situations, but it does not have universal application to all cases, as it is only likely to be true with the benefit of hindsight. To illustrate this, I have prepared a scenario where a compensation event occurs and is assessed at the time as causing six weeks delay with no project manager's assumptions and is implemented within three weeks of being notified. In the event, the compensation event only caused three weeks delay. Let us look at how this would be analysed retrospectively, prospectively with the benefit of hindsight and prospectively at the time the compensation event occurred. Here is a simple programme showing five activities, including excavation and foundations, substructure, superstructure, MEP and fit-out, and commissioning, leading to planned completion at the end of week 15. In order to look at the project retrospectively, i.e. with the benefit of hindsight, we plot the as-built programme against the as-planned programme, and can see that completion occurred three weeks late at the end of week 18. The excavation and foundations activity and the substructure activity were completed on time. However, the superstructure activity has been delayed by three weeks, and then the subsequent activities of MEP and fit-out and commissioning were completed within their original durations. Therefore, when we plot the compensation event that we know lasted three weeks on the programme at the end of week six, it explains the three-week delay to the start of the superstructure activity and the delay to completion of three weeks. Now, let us look at a prospective analysis retrospectively. We start with the same as planned program, but update it with progress up to the point just before the compensation event occurred. When we do this, progress shows that the as planned program is still on schedule to complete by the end of week 15, and there is no delay just prior to the occurrence of the compensation event. We then impact the compensation event on the program with the benefit of hindsight. So we know that the compensation event only had a three week effect, we can see that this pushes the planned completion date out by three weeks to the end of week 18, corresponding with completion in the as-built program, and in effect we have the same result as a retrospective analysis. However, if we had carried out a prospective analysis at the time, i.e. contemporaneously without the benefit of hindsight, we would not know that the compensation event was only going to have a three-week delaying effect and would have forecast or prospected forward a six week delay pushing planned completion out to the end of week 21, giving a different result to the as built programme or retrospective analysis. Therefore, prospective and retrospective analyses do not always give the same result in every situation, or alternatively, only give the same result when the forecast delays are the same as the actual delays that materialised. One question that can arise when a prospective analysis at the time is shown by later events to not reflect the actual situation, is what should be shown on the programme for acceptance under the NEC3 form of contract. In answering this question, attention needs to be given to the following clauses within the contract, which can be difficult to square. Clause 65.2, which provides that the assessment of a compensation event is not revised if a forecast upon which it is based is shown by later recorded information to have been wrong. Clause 31.3 provides reasons for not accepting the programme that include the contractor's plans which it shows are not practicable and that it does not represent the contractor's plans realistically. And Clause 32.1, which provides that the contractor shows on each revised programme the actual progress achieved on each operation and its effects upon the timing of the remaining work, the effects of implemented compensation events, how the contractor plans to deal with any delays and to correct notified defects, 
and any other changes which the contractor proposes to make to the accepted programme. Let us return to our scenario to examine this practically. The programme is as before, showing the retrospective situation with a three-week delay and the prospective situation at the time with a six-week delay. Firstly, it should be noted that in accordance with Clause 65.2, the assessment of a compensation event is not revised if a forecast upon which it is based is shown by later recorded information to have been wrong. So if the compensation event is implemented with a six week delay, then that is it, and it will not be revised to the true effect of three weeks established after it was implemented. However, Clause 6 relates to compensation events and should not be confused with what needs to be shown on the programme the contractor has to submit for acceptance under Clause 3, which needs to be practicable and realistic. Indeed, if the contractor submitted a programme for acceptance under Clause 3, showing the six-week delay assessed at the time the compensation event occurred, then his plans are arguably not realistic or practicable by the time the next programme is submitted when the actual delay of three weeks is known. And in this case, the project manager is likely to reject the programme under Clause 31.3. A more significant problem can arise out of Clause 32.1, where the contractor is required to show the effects of implemented compensation events on the revised programme for acceptance, at the same time as showing actual progress achieved on each operation and its effect upon the timing of the remaining work, as well as plans to deal with delays and the like. Practically, this could cause significant problems. For example, when we update the prospective situation at the next progress reporting interval, it could be argued that it is necessary to show the effect of the implemented compensation event as well as the progress that has been achieved on the activities and remaining work. Even in our simple scenario, the programme begins to lose clarity. Just imagine a programme with 10,000 activities and over 100 compensation events and having to show all the effects of compensation events as implemented, as well as actual progress to produce a realistic plan. The programme would become a complete mess and inoperable. It is considered that this is not what Clause 3 is trying to achieve. The programme submitted for acceptance under Core Clause 3 is about recording the progress of the works to date and setting out a realistic and practicable plan for all the remaining work, including implemented compensation events, unimplemented compensation events, and other work that is necessary to provide a genuine forecast for planned completion. Therefore, the implemented compensation event should be included within the Clause 3 programme, with its true progress, showing it as complete after three weeks possibly while still highlighting its assessed effect of six weeks as implemented. It would also be prudent to note the effect on the completion date, but it is not believed to be practicable to show the effect of the compensation event as implemented on all its subsequent activities and revisions to the accepted programme. These effects can be identified within programmes submitted with quotations under Clause 62.2 or alternatively in the assessments of the programme for the remaining work made by the project manager as per Clauses 64.1 and 64.2. It is hoped some clarity is brought to the meaning of showing the effects of implemented compensation events on the revised programme in any future editions of NEC. I would now like to show you a retrospective analysis running alongside a prospective analysis on a NEC3 contract where compensation events have occurred and the forecast delays do not materialise as assessed at the time. The starting point is the as-planned programme from before, showing planned completion at the end of week 15. However, this time the completion date is shown at the end of week 19. Therefore, there is four weeks of terminal float, as defined in the NEC guidance notes as the difference between plan completion and the completion date. The as-built situation is shown below and shows plan completion or what would actually be completion at the end of week 25. So plan completion has slipped 10 weeks from week 15 to week 25. There were also three compensation events that occurred. Compensation event number one, which was forecast to take six weeks in week six, but actually only took three weeks. Compensation event number two, which was forecast to take four weeks in week 11, but actually only took two weeks. And compensation event number three, which was forecast to take two weeks in week 17, but actually took four weeks. Therefore, we have two compensation events actually taking longer than forecast and one compensation event actually taking less than originally assessed. What we are going to examine here in particular is where will the completion date, i.e. the contractual position, end up. 
when you carry out a retrospective analysis and a perspective analysis of these facts. In order to do this, I've divided the screen into two to carry out a perspective analysis in the top half of the screen and a retrospective analysis in the bottom half. I have started by showing the plan program or first accepted program at commencement in both halves of the screen. The tables in the top right hand corner of each half of the screen show the program details where for the first accepted program plan completion occurs at the end of week 15. The completion date occurs at the end of week 19. The terminal float representing the period between plan completion and the completion date is four weeks and there are no delays to attribute to the contractor or the employer. Firstly, we introduced compensation event number one at the start of week six, which was assessed to take six weeks, but actually only took three weeks. To analyze its effect, we take the accepted program relevant at the time, the second accepted program. And when we do this, it is apparent that the excavation and foundations activity has been completed one week late, with the effect of delaying plan completion one week from week 15 to week 16. Since there are no compensation events within this period of work, the completion date remains the same at the end of week 19 and the terminal float reduces from four weeks to three weeks. In other words, the contractor is responsible for the one week delay to the project. This is the same for the prospective situation and retrospective situation as shown in the tables in the top right hand corner of each screen. Now, under the prospective situation, when the accepted program is updated for progress, and a six week delay is impacted on the substructure activity, it pushes plan completion out six weeks from week 16 to week 22. Under clause 63.3, a delay to the completion date is assessed as the length of time that, due to the compensation event, plan completion is later than plan completion as shown on the accepted program. And so the completion date also moves out six weeks from week 19 to week 25. Consequently, the terminal float remains the same at three weeks and the employer is responsible for the six week delay to the project. As we are still in a prospective situation, we cannot yet show the retrospective situation as we do not have the benefit of hindsight of what actually happened. This occurs when we look at accepted program number three, where we can see that the assessed effect of compensation event number one turned out to be wrong and only took three weeks with the effect that plan completion comes back three weeks from week 22 to week 19 in the prospective situation. This in turn has the effect of the terminal float increasing from three weeks to six weeks as the completion date cannot be revised backwards. In the retrospective situation, we simply show the known three weeks delay to the substructure activity, which has the effect of pushing plan completion out three weeks from week 16 to week 19. The completion date will move by a corresponding duration in accordance with clause 63.3 from week 19 to week 22, with the employer being responsible for a three week delay to the project. The terminal float remains at three weeks. In summary, we have divergence in the completion date and the terminal float under the two different analyses. Now, we introduce compensation event number two at the start of week 11, which was assessed to take four weeks, but actually only took two weeks. To analyze its effect in the prospective situation, we update accepted program number three and impact a four week delay on the superstructure activity. When we do this, it pushes planned completion out four weeks from week 19 to week 23. The completion date will also move by a corresponding duration in accordance with clause 63.3 from week 25 to week 29, and the employer is responsible for a four week delay. Again, as we are still in a prospective situation, we cannot yet show the retrospective situation. When we look at accepted program number four, we can see that the assessed effect of compensation event number two turned out to be wrong again, and only took two weeks with the effect that plan completion comes back two weeks from week 23 to week 21 in the prospective situation. This in turn has the effect of the terminal float increasing from six weeks to eight weeks as the completion date cannot be revised backwards. In the retrospective situation, we simply show the known two weeks delay to the superstructure activity, which has the effect of pushing plan completion out two weeks from week 19 to week 21. The completion date will move by a corresponding duration in accordance with clause 63.3 from week 22 to week 24 with the employer being responsible for a two week delay to the project. The terminal float remains at three weeks. 
In summary, we have further divergence in the completion date and the terminal float under the two different analyses. Finally, we look at a compensation event that is later determined to be underassessed. Accordingly, we introduce compensation event number three at the start of week 17, which was assessed to take two weeks, but actually took four weeks. To analyse its effect in a prospective situation, we use the accepted program at the time, or accepted program number five. And when we do this, we note that there has been no further delay at this point. We then impact the accepted program number five with a two week delay to the MEP and fit out activity. And when we do this, it pushes planned completion out two weeks from week 21 to week 23. The completion date will also move by a corresponding duration from week 29 to week 31, and the employer is responsible for a two week delay. Again, as we're still in a prospective situation, we cannot yet show the retrospective situation. When we look at accepted program number six, we can see that the assessed effect of compensation event number three turned out to be wrong again, and actually took four weeks, with the effect that plan completion is pushed out from week 23 to week 25 in the prospective situation. I have temporarily removed the program details table in the top right hand corner, just so that we can see the effect on plan completion before bringing it back to record the results of the analysis. The effects on the terminal float is a decrease of two weeks from eight weeks to six weeks, as compensation event number three has been implemented and cannot be revised, so the completion date remains the same. In the retrospective situation, we simply show the known four weeks delay to the MEP and fit out activity, which has the effect of pushing plan completion out four weeks from week 21 to week 25. The completion date will move by a corresponding duration in accordance with clause 63.3 from week 24 to week 28, with the employer being responsible for a four week delay. The terminal float again remains at three weeks. In summary, we have different results, although this time they go in favour of the employer instead of the contractor. Overall, we have found that a prospective analysis carried out at the time and a retrospective analysis can give different results for the completion date, and all this on a simple five bar program with just three compensation events. It may be noted in our scenario that the divergence relates only to the completion date, and that prolongation costs may possibly just reflect the actual period of overrun, but if assessments are made at the time, then there is a likelihood that different costs will be applied to compensation events in the prospective and retrospective situations. Finally, for completeness, we can look at progress through to completion via accepted program numbers seven and eight. When we remove the progress date lines, it becomes clearer and it is evident that for the same as built facts on the same project, that the delay analysis approach can produce markedly different results with respect to the completion date. Thank you for listening and please do not hesitate to ask me any questions or make any inquiries on my contact details below.